And if you want to talk about how old music is, it stands to reason, this isn't an argument, it's just a thought experiment really, that long before humans thought about fashioning instruments out of bone and wood and things like this, they would have been singing or beating their chests or clapping their hands or you know, doing things with found objects like rocks and sticks. So music probably predated these artifacts by tens of thousands of years. There's a lot of probabilities in here, but this is what we have to deal with. Um, Jonathan talked about three black holes in music, uh, two black holes in music, timbre and surprise. And I think timbre is one of the things that's interested me most for the last really 25 years or so, even before I uh, began studying from a scientific standpoint. As a recording engineer and a record producer and as a musician, at least in pop music, timbre is everything. I mean, and when I say that, I mean anybody who's a fan of Hendrix could recognize the sound of Hendrix's guitar within three notes. I can unearth some recording that you didn't know existed from some vault somewhere and play it for you and ask you, is this Hendrix or Jefferson Airplane or ZZ Top or you know, Stevie Ray Vaughan or West Montgomery for that matter? And you know, any, anybody with even a passing familiarity with Hendrix within 50 milliseconds would be able to say, well, of course that's Hendrix. It couldn't be anybody else. And when you turn to voices, there's nobody that sounds like Nora Jones, or like the Beatles, or like Joni Mitchell, or like Paul Simon. The voice is a compositional tool. And Ravel understood this. Ravel may have been among the, the first who really, uh, I'll defer to my musicology colleagues here without, um, with the caveat that I, I don't really know this for a fact. It's just my layperson's intuition that Ravel was one of the first composers to really push this idea of timbre as a compositional tool with uh, Bolero, where you have the same rhythmic and melodic pattern played sequentially on different instruments, really bringing timbre to the forefront. And since we've had recording, going back to the Edison cylinder and, and the early recordings of Caruso, and certainly through the 50s and 60s, a lot of what we are buying as consumers and as music listeners is the sound. There's a sound to records that's different than the sound of a live performance. You buy a Pink Floyd record, it's different than the Pink Floyd performance, and you're buying into a whole bunch of electronic wizardry and gimmickry and contraptions that sort of confer a sound to a modern musical group. And we don't understand anything about that. And as Jonathan says, we don't have a vocabulary for it. It is a black hole. But it's a fascinating one that's helped us to understand a lot about the operating of human memory. So um, in formal and informal experiments that have been done now for years, we know that people can recognize music with just a hundred milliseconds of a, of a snippet. People can identify by name what the music is, or if not the song name, at least the group name. That's a tenth of a second. That's shorter than would allow melody to develop or even a rhythm to develop. It's less than the length of a typical note and yet people know what it is. This tells us that memory, far from being sort of the way we used to think about it when I was an undergraduate, was that memory was, some of us thought, some people thought this, that memory was largely relational, or that you had a memory for the gist of things, and that the function of memory was to form abstractions of um, the world and not bother you with details. Uh, we now know that, there, well, that's true, that's there too, but that's not the only function of memory. Memory grabs these, these perceptual details and it holds on to them. Uh, we have memory for absolute details of features. Steve Palmer and I were talking about, uh, before, uh, just earlier today, about Jeff Hawkins' observation that we're doing this uh, in real time in almost every interaction we have with daily objects. If you go to a doorknob of your house and somebody, you know, some elves came and changed it in the middle of the night for a doorknob that's slightly shinier or slightly stickier or functions in a slightly different way, you're going to feel the difference instantly. If your hairbrush is somehow different, you'll notice it. But it's a kind of, um, you know, the brain being a giant change detector, really, uh, among other things, that it's exquisitely sensitive to changes in the environment. You don't notice the sameness of objects, but as soon as there's a slight difference, you notice it, and you notice it in sound. You notice it when somebody's smiling at you on the phone, if they're not usually smiling, or if for the first time your mother calls you on the phone and she's suddenly not smiling. 
uh, you notice that within just a few seconds, regardless of what she says. You can say, hi, Mom, how are you? She can say, fine. But you know she's not fine. You know she's mad at you about something, and you're going to get it. <laughs> you must have a woman like mine. Uh, so there's this, um, there's this detail that's encoded there, and a lot of it's in timbre. We don't really know what timbre is or how to talk about it. Another thing Jonathan talked about was expectations, and um, we've been looking at expectations in the linguistic and in the communicative domain for many decades. And Herb Clark, of course, has done a lot of the most interesting work on issues around turn-taking and how it is that we expect what's coming next in the sentence uh, and in any kind of a verbal interaction. But of course, musicians do this too. Any kind of a, even not in an improvisational context, but uh, just a string quartet. There's a lot of negotiation going on, uh, you know, non-verbal, visual, as well as auditory, trying to get together uh, and anticipate what others are going to do so that you can do the right thing. And doing this requires really quite complicated neural mechanisms, uh, something that any, almost any human can do, and almost all children can do, of course, is to clap in synchrony. This is something that seems to be uniquely human among mammals setting aside the issue of whether Snowball or Cockatoo can do it or not, which is still open to question. Uh, there are some statistical issues about that that have yet to be resolved. But um, uh, having to deal with the correct uh, null hypothesis for synchrony, we can talk about that later. But certainly among mammals, humans are the only mammal that can synchronize. And we do it effortlessly, and we do it from the age of one and a half or so. And think about what that requires. If you want to synchronize with me clapping, you have to take in the visual event or the auditory or both and form some anticipation and actually begin your movements you know, ahead of, of mine, anticipating mine in order to synchronize, in order to make it happen at the same time. And you have to adjust for, you know, if I'm across the room, that there's a certain number of milliseconds of delay where you're not actually hearing it and yet you can still synchronize. It's a very complex chain of events, motor action planning, we call it in cognitive science that involves a number of disparate functions and it seems to be innately, innate and hardwired. Uh, I remember when I was a student, uh, Herb had a student named Jeannie Foxtree who did this really fascinating study of uh, people's ability to predict what was coming next in a sentence when the speaker had a speech disfluency. Now, please correct me if I get the details wrong, but as I recall it, um, a lot of people say um, uh, or they'll say uh, or they'll hesitate. And among other things that she found, there was this interesting distinction between whether a person said um or uh. She could predict whether what followed was a noun phrase or a verb phrase or the length of what was coming on the basis of whether the person said um or uh. Do I have just oh, this? Roughly right. <laughs> uh, I apologize, it's, it's 15 years ago. Uh, but that, that's sort of the gist. I don't have accurate, detailed memory for that, I apologize. If she had sung it, maybe I wouldn't. Uh, but the, the point isn't in the detail there. It's in this exquisite ability we have to predict what's coming. And I think that, from my uh, perspective, expectation in music is everything. It is our appreciation of music. I wouldn't, I'm not even saying it has something to do with it. It is our appreciation of music. And the job of the composer is to hit some sort of sweet spot where um, from note to note, you're forming some expectations about what's going to happen. And most of the time, or much of the time, those expectations are going to be rewarded to some degree. But every once in a while, the composer is going to complete a phrase in a way that you never thought of. And that's better than anything you could have thought of. That's why they're composers. But if retrospectively, it sounds to you better than anything you could have imagined, somehow they manage play something you didn't figure, but it just feels right. It's, oh, you can end it that way. Or you can go from here to here by, by doing that. I never would have imagined that, but there's something about it that feels structurally, semantically, syntactically, aesthetically right. This is not something I could imagine, but it just, it, it's rewarding. That's when the composer has you for life. That's a musical piece you can listen to over and over again for 40 or 50 years, and you never get tired of it. 